yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm revealing the very best Karate Kid Easter eggs, epic callbacks, and hidden details you might have missed in the third season of Cobra Kai. Spoilers ahead of course, so take care. Before they came up with Eagle Fang as the name for Johnny's new dojo. Welcome to Eagle Fang Karate. Eagles don't have fangs. The show's writers tossed around various suggestions for different animals that his character would think of as representing strength and masculinity, including lions. The final idea came from Johnny's 80s mentality and the eagle that he has on the wall of his apartment. And I imagine something that also influenced the name was Johnny's love of a particular 80s military action movie that we see him watch repeatedly. What are your likes? I like muscle cars, an iron eagle, and iron eagle too. As for the fang part of the dojo title, the showrunners say that's just consistent with Johnny's ignorance and he thinks it sounds badass. You gotta swoop down like an eagle, grab him with your claws and sink your fangs into him. When the country club's kitchen staff start dishing out spaghetti and red sauce, don't skimp on that sauce. It sets up a callback to the original Karate Kid movie, where Daniel gets covered in that same food after bumping into a waiter when he sneaks into the country club kitchen and sees Johnny kissing Ali on the dance floor. This time though the boots on the other foot, as it's Johnny who arrives at the club for a date with Ali to find her and Daniel together. But luckily for him, unlike young Daniel, adult Johnny narrowly avoids a run-in with the red sauce. Hey, watch it. I'm wearing white here. You think I want that all over me? And when Johnny makes fun of Daniel's suit, his rivals come back. He should talk there, Scarface. Is a reference to Al Pacino's famous movie role as penniless Cuban Tony Montana, who became a drug lord nicknamed Scarface in 1980s Miami. The way Ali greets Daniel when she sees him for the first time in decades at the country club Daniel with an L is a nod to this scene in the original movie. Hey, you got a name? Ali with an I. Hey, what's your name? Daniel with an L. And Tori does a similar thing in season two. My name's Miguel. Tori. With a Y. When the LaRussos invite Cobra Kai's landlord over for dinner to ask him to stop renting the dojo to Crease, the camera starts the scene by focusing in on a dish of macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese? Hey, you know what I like. <laughs> I grew up on macaroni and cheese. I never say no when it comes to macaroni and cheese. The skeleton hoodie Tori wears during Cobra Kai's brutal payback attack on Miyagi-Do is a hat tip to the skeleton costumes Johnny and his crew wore to the Halloween dance and while they were beating up Daniel afterwards and getting their butts kicked by Mr. Miyagi in the original movie. And that skeleton costume actually popped up in season one when Johnny gave it to Miguel to wear for his Halloween dance. And like Johnny all those years earlier, Miguel also ended up in a fight that night. In both the TV show and the original movie, the beef between Cobra Kai and Miyagi-Do also plays out on the soccer pitch. Dimitri deliberately trips Hawk up, just like Bobby did to Daniel in the first movie. And curiously, the music you hear during the match in the series is Rock and Roll Over You, which featured in the second movie's ice-breaking scene. One of the fun things about Cobra Kai is getting to see parts of the Karate Kid movies from a different perspective. Tell them how they pushed you down that hill. I thought it was a cliff. And it seems like there's a shout out at the school board meeting to the popular satirical YouTube video by J. Matthew Turner about Danny being the real villain of the Karate Kid. When I went to school here, I was bullied and karate saved me. I heard you were the real bully. That's also a nod to the first season where Johnny claimed to Miguel that he was victimized by Daniel. Out of nowhere, the guy sucker punches me. What an asshole. I know, man. Though this season, Daniel gives Miguel his version of events. All that I knew is that he broke her radio. She was upset. I was being chivalrous. And speaking of different sides to the story, it turns out that Daniel's reason for his and Ali's breakup... She tells me that she's just fallen in love with some football player from UCLA. ...was rather different to Ali's version. So I got into UCLA, and I ran into this guy that I knew who went there. Daniel sees me talking to my friend. He jumps to conclusions. I thought you were in love with the guy. And they didn't see eye to eye on Daniel's 47 Ford either, with Daniel complaining to Mr. Miyagi that. First I let Allie borrow the car and she redesigns my fender. And I don't know what you do with the engine, but that ain't running right either. Whereas according to Ali. I told you that the brakes on Mr. Miyagi's car were gonna go. I hope you didn't tell him that it was my fault it crashed. No, of course not. And when Ali calls Daniel and Johnny out over their relentless bickering, she neatly sums up the premise of the entire Cobra Kai show. You say one thing and then you say the opposite. You both think there's only one side to the story. There's your side and your side, and then there is the truth. Talking of different viewpoints, the show continues to include unused footage from the original movies that's never been seen before, as they did in the very first scene in season one. This season, the flashbacks to Chosen's final fight with Daniel 
Daniel. When Miyagi impresses on him how serious the situation is, Daniel's reply, I know, has been added to the scene. It's not tournament. It's for real. I know. When Daniel goes to Cobra Kai looking for Johnny at the start of the season but finds Kreese there instead, as he enters the space he sees the phrase fear does not exist in this dojo painted on the wall, where previously Johnny's Cobra Kai logo had been. Those were Kreese's very first words in the original Karate Kid movie that Danny heard when he visited his dojo for the first time. Fear does not exist in this dojo, does it? No! Adding to Danny's sense of deja vu is a standee of the older Kreese, similar to the one he saw of the younger villain in the film. In the present day, Kreese delights in rubbing in the fact Miguel was put in a coma by a kid taught by Daniel, and he uses a Mr. Miyagiism to make the point. But I don't really blame Robbie, because you know what they say, there's no such thing as a bad student. No such thing, uh, bad student, only bad teacher. Season 3 fills us in on Kreese's backstory, and the first flashback to his youth is deliberately set up to make us think at first that this guy here is actually the young Kreese. They're the opponent. You don't show them mercy. And it's only when the busboy's employer shouts at him that we realise who he really is. Kreese! Tables are not gonna bust themselves. Get back to work. And a neat little inside joke that adds to this scene's fake out is that the guy we initially think is Kreese is in fact played by Jesse Cove, the son of actor Martin Cove, who plays the adult Kreese. The showrunners initially framed Kreese as a typical underdog, as they wanted us to see him in a different light, because as they told EW, one of the show's central themes is redemption and looking back at these black and white characters and trying to find the grey. Another neat detail about that scene is that it kicks off with the same kind of car that Mr. Miyagi gifted Daniel in the first film, a 47 Ford. Piece of junk. I'm gonna scrap this and buy some muscle. Although the license plate is different to Daniel's, I wouldn't be surprised if they're supposed to be the same car, perhaps saved from the scrapyard. After all, that's how Eric got his ride in the franchise's fourth film. Do you like my car? I saved it from the junkyard. The old article about Kreese from the 80s that Robbie finds online includes a quote from him that second and third place don't count, which echoes his mantra from the first film Defeat does not exist in this dojo! and recalls his treatment of Johnny in the second one. Second place is no place, you're off the team. And as we see in the finale when he suggests settling everything in the tournament, Kreese is still goading Johnny about that second place back in 84 all these years later, because notice how he looks at Johnny when he says, if you lose. If you lose, we won't lose. And the second article that Robbie pulls up about how Miyagi's dojo defanged Kreese's cobras has the same title as the newspaper clipping that Kreese picked up then tossed aside in the third movie. Speaking of Johnny's Facebook photos, those shirtless shots that Miguel tactfully turns down for a sensei's new profile are actually real photos taken of William Zabka for teen magazines during his days as a teen idol. The showrunners had been ready to recreate a few shots, but as Zabka had some photos on hand that worked, they went with those. When Chosen first shows up, his angry demeanour suggests he's still holding a grudge against Daniel for humiliating him in the second film, and you can tell by Daniel's clenched fist that he hasn't forgotten Mr. Miyagi's words. Daniel-san, in Okinawa, Anna have no time limit. And the way Chosen interrupts Daniel and Kumiko just after their hands lightly brush against each other at the bar mirrors how, in the movie, he disturbed them just as they started to hold hands on their date. With actor Yuji Okumoto back as chosen, the show tips its hat to several of his and Daniel's tussles from the sequel, including humorously reversing their roles in their big fight scene compared to the movie. Hog. And later when Chosen gives Daniel one of Mr. Miyagi's scrolls, you keep for your collection. That's a riff on the scene in the movie where Kumiko pelts Chosen with a tomato after he attacks Daniel. You keep for your collection. I know you like it. When Chosen shows Daniel around his dojo, you can see several pictures there that are the same ones as Daniel hung up in his dojo last season. In fact, this photo here is actually a real-life martial artist from Okinawa who founded the Gajuru School of Karate. And it's especially fitting that he appears in the show because Robert Mark Kamen, who created the original Karate Kid characters and wrote the first three movies, trained in that particular method, and his instructor learned it from the founder himself, whose photo we see here. During their catch-up in Okinawa, Kumiko reveals why London's the favourite place she's visited over the years. I got to see the cranberries open for Radiohead. They played Zombie, Linga, 
and dream. That's a nod to the franchise's fourth movie, The Next Karate Kid, where Hilary Swank's character Julie practices her karate moves to the sounds of the Cranberry song Dreams, and the monks at the Buddhist monastery where she's staying join in dancing. Never trust spiritual leader who cannot dance. And when Kumiko tells Daniel that she never married, but stayed a free agent. That's a reference to how Daniel told her he was single in the movie. Are you ready? Oh, you kidding? I'm free agent. What is free agent? It just means that I'm available. Curiously, after she left the dance company, her life somewhat parallels her aunt Yuki's, who taught Obon dance in Okinawa, and chose not to wed after her young love, Mr. Miyagi, left. Why you never marry? You never come back. I'm supposed to believe that a guy never got a ring on that finger. None of them fought to the death for me. Which is, of course, a reference to how Chosen took her hostage to force Daniel to fight him. Tracy Taguchi, who played the little girl Yuna in the second film, also returns, and just as Daniel saved her during the typhoon all those decades ago, thanks to her position as the senior vice president of sales for Doyona, she's able to return the favour and help Daniel save his business. Also during Daniel's trip to Okinawa, there's an amusing shout-out to the scene in the Karate Kid Part 2, where the young Daniel broke six blocks of ice in a bet. This time, though, the ice is just for drinks at a bar. Season 2 already tipped its hat to that famous scene when Daniel was about to perform a demonstration to encourage new Miyagi-Do students, when he was interrupted by Cobra Kai's showy a demo with fire. Kreese may have kicked Johnny out of his own dojo at the end of season 2, but in the first episode of the new season we see that Johnny is still taking a page out of Kreese's book. This time he's putting his fist through car windows during a fight, just like Kreese did back in The Karate Kid Part 2. And it's not just car windows that get smashed this season, as during their fight in the finale, Kreese throws Daniel through a window pane at the Cobra Kai dojo, a callback to when he turned up out of the blue at the start of season 2 and ended up kicking Johnny into one of the dojo mirrors. All of which is a nod to Mr Miyagi's fight with Kreese and his army pal Silver in The Karate Kid Part 3. Oh, and just to confirm how much Cobra Kai are taking after their new sensei, the final episode also shows the Cobra kids throwing Bert through the kitchen window at the LaRusso home. When Kreese starts to choke Johnny during their final face-off, that's a callback to what he did in the second film. He has actually had Johnny in a chokehold in the series before now, though he was giving a demo in a class at the time rather than trying to beat him up. Given he's such a fan of the Iron Eagle movie, it's no wonder Johnny takes Miguel to a gig by Dee Snider this season. After all, we're not gonna take it, a song by Snider's former heavy metal band Twisted Sister features in that film. And the Cobra Kai series itself used the same song in season 1 during Johnny's unconventional training with his students for the tournament. When Miguel takes photos of Johnny for his Facebook page, look at the book he's pretending to read. It's called Queen of Hearts, which is fitting because Johnny's having these photos taken to impress his former teen love, Ali. But also the book's about two long-time friends who are forced to reassess their lives when an old flame returns out of the blue. Now, Daniel and Johnny may not be friends exactly, but they do go way back, and their old flame Ali turning up all of a sudden does force them to confront the truth about their past and themselves. You guys are more alike than you want to admit. After the car wash fundraiser, the Cobra Kai bullies wait for Nathaniel to be by himself on his push bike, then arrive on their motorbikes to beat him up, which is a throwback to when Johnny and his Cobra Kai buds got Daniel when he was alone on his bicycle and roughed him up by driving him off the track with their motorbikes. After the big fight between the kids at golf and stuff, Amanda confronts Kreese at his dojo. Hey Rambo. Calling Kreese Rambo, of course, fits his tough, aggressive character and his Vietnam background. But it's also a nod to the fact that actor Martin Cove appeared in the second film in that franchise. When Daniel's scrolling through family photos on his phone at the bar in Japan, I think this picture here is Ralph Macho with his real-life daughter Julia. And at the city council meeting, this looks like a cameo from Macho's actual son, Daniel. When the show first introduces Kreese's army buddies, everything about this guy here points to him being Terry Silver, the main villain in the third movie. From his ponytails to the shape of his face, his whole manner and the way he talks. Johnny, Johnny. Hey! Johnny, Johnny, Johnny! So it's a bit of a shock when he's killed off and the other guy, Twig, is revealed as the real Silver. Shut your goddamn mouth, Silver! And Twig's line in the show I owe you, man. echoes his words to Kreese in the third movie. I owe you, man. And now with Kreese's phone call in the finale, we look set to see the original actor who played Silver in the movie, Thomas Ian Griffiths, back on screen with his Cobra Kai chum. And I talk more about that in my Season 3 Ending Explained video. Tap here to watch that or follow the link in the video description.
And it's also interesting how this finale uses the classic 80s song In the Air Tonight to underscore the dramatic build-up to next season's showdown, in a moment that couldn't be more 1980s if he was wearing an I Heart the 80s hoodie and headband. The lyrics, I've been waiting for this moment all my life, are especially fitting and neatly meta, as not only has Kreese been craving revenge for years, but many fans of the show have also been hoping for a team-up between Daniel and Johnny. I also like the way the finale subtly tips its hat to Daniel and Johnny's showdown at the end of the first Karate Kid film, by having Daniel dressed in white and Johnny in black. So what other Easter eggs, callbacks or awesome details did you spot this season? And what was your favourite moment? Comment below and if you enjoyed this leave a thumbs up, I really appreciate it. Tap left for my next Cobra Kai video or tap right for something else you're sure to like. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!